something that uh, will help all of us, something that's beneficial to everyone in here, whether you have a family or had a family or going to start a family, any of those kind of things, this will help you tonight, even young people, um, if you'll pay attention and take some and heed some of these things. You know, I just, I wish there were so many things I would have listened to better when I was younger. You know, if you could go back and talk to yourself and shake yourself, and I don't know, I was probably hard-headed and probably wouldn't have done it then either, but um, I sure wish I would have listened better. But uh, young folks, you can, uh, you, can, you can take this from me. Listen, amen? Especially when it comes to God's word. And uh, we're talking about um, the family, and uh, tonight I just want to talk about um, uh, some things about drawing your family back together again. And we're going to be in the Song of Solomon tonight. You think, what a unique place. We'll talk about that here in just a minute, but... The Song of Solomon here in just a moment. As you're making your way there, if you find your way to uh, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you'll find yourself um, at the Song of Solomon right after all of those books, if it's kind of newer for you to look into that one. As you're turning there, I, I saw this, I thought it was cute. A boy asks his father, Daddy, are bugs good to eat? That's disgusting. Don't talk about such things like that over the dinner, the dad replies. After dinner, the father, asked, the father asked, Now, son, what did you want to know about eating bugs? Oh, nothing, the boy says. There was a bug in your soup, but it's gone now. <laughs> I like that. You know, there ought to be more laughter in our families. Amen. I'm not talking about that tonight, but there ought to be some of those. Sometimes families uh, can come, come almost stoic sometimes. Um, and there's, there's definitely a need for that in the, in the home, but there's also a need for laughter. Amen. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I just pray, help us to take these truths that we find in the Song of Solomon, Lord. And I just pray, help them to apply us, apply these things to our families, Lord. Lord, whether <clears throat> we're waiting to have a family one day, I pray, Father, that we think about this and, and add this, Lord, to, uh, to, our, to our family structure, Lord. Uh, Lord, if, we ha if we're grandparents, Father, that we can still use these things, Lord. And just, uh, Lord, if we're children to parents, Father, uh, uh, any of those that we have our parents still here, Father, just any of those things, I pray, help us today, Lord. Help us, Lord, when we leave here, that, uh, uh, Father, we have a, um, not only a concern, Lord, but, Lord, we have some ready uh, uh, methods, Father, to how to strengthen our family. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> it's no doubt that uh, families are falling apart. You probably know of a family, and maybe even several, that uh, have gone through you know, all kinds of, um, of heartbreaking things, divorces and, um, and suicides and uh, angers and fights and all those kind of things. Sometimes it's the children running away from home. Sometimes it's one of the parents that run away from home. In America, they say that over 50% of all homes are broken by someone leaving. Over 50%. Now, we know about the divorce rates being a above and beyond that statistic of someone who has just left the home. <clears throat> Sometimes everyone lives at home, but the home is full of animosity, short tempers, hurt feelings, those kind of things. And, and, and those things, that they don't have to be in a Christian home, amen? I know we're people, and, and, and we live in the real world, and we face challenges, but just because we're people, and there's sin, and, and we... We live in the real world and we face challenges. Doesn't mean there needs to be animosity in the home. Amen. Doesn't either needs be. Doesn't mean there needs to be anger and yelling and hurt feelings and all those. Those things do not have to exist inside the home. I've I told you that um, you know to look into the Song of Solomon. It's interesting. We call it the Song of Solomon. That's what the big title on your on your page probably says. But in Scripture, we have the Holy of Holies. We have the Heaven of Heavens. We have the King of Kings. And then this starts off in verse 1 with the Song of Songs. Certainly, as we look at the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, it's often used maybe uh, around the time of, of Valentine's Day or those kind of things, maybe even counseling as a guide to maybe intimacy between a husband and a wife. And, and, and to some degree, I'm, it can be used in, in, in that matter, no doubt. But it, it's so much more than that. Song of Solomon, is, I believe, really, it's just a... Uh, a loving heavenly father wooing his intended back to himself again. I think that's what it relates to us. Again, there's a lot more applications, even historical, e even, even as far as poetic, all those kind of things, but I believe that's the overall emphasis of this book. It's unique. Um, it's not a book that, that, that scolds or corrects. 
it's really more of, of one of, 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 again, drawing, of joy, of, of comfort, of contentment, of those kind of things. It might be one book that reminds you maybe of your earlier parts of your relationship when you were wooing one or the other, you know. I'm sure some of you were wooed by your wife and some of you were wooed by your husband. Let me just ask you that question. Who, who chased who? How many husbands would say, I'm the one that chased my wife? Okay. A few of you. How many wives would say, I'm the one that chased my husband? All the same people? <laughs> so good. Chasing each other around in circles. Amen. All right. Go ahead and turn to chapter 2 if you're there in the, in the book of Song of uh, uh, Solomon. <clears throat> he says here in verse 9, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Like I said, the Song of Solomon is really about a king and a shepherd vying for an intimate relationship with a Shulamite woman. The king has a physical, I think, more of a uh, lusting longing. And the shepherd, I believe, has a deep love and wants only the best for the woman. Where the king, and I believe, again, this this is my opinion of what this looks like, and I think it's the only way that makes sense. The king is the drawing of the world. The shepherd is the drawing of God himself. And we're going to talk about family tonight. This is not really necessarily a family uh, counseling book, if you will. Like I said before, a lot of things it doesn't deal with. It doesn't deal with discipline or training or work or those kind of things. And it's a, it's a book, like I said, of God wooing his bride, his people. It is from him a, a perfect love, a sacrificial love that gra- God uses to draw him to, to, to draw us to himself. Um, <coughs> and it's in that vein that I'd like, like to look at these verses tonight in a way that, that we can help in our home, whether we're a husband or a wife or a child or uh, anyone else, uh, by, by using God's method to draw us, and we use those methods to draw our family closer together as well. Now, I read that verse, My beloved is like a row of young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. <coughs> he looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. <coughs> when love is real, when love is true, it does not force itself. And that's, again, maybe, a, maybe a, um, something to point out to, to younger people, and it applies to all of us, no doubt. But um, if someone is ever coercing you into a relationship or into any kind of physical contact, um, then that is not love. It's contrary to what Scripture says. Um, uh, uh, intimate physical contact only belongs between a husband and a wife um, and nowhere else. Amen? Help me out here. Parents, Amen? Young people, whether you amen or not, that's the truth. It doesn't belong anywhere outside of marriage. And I can point out place after place in Scripture to show you that, but that's not the, 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 the direction I'm going here tonight. But it doesn't force itself. It's looked at like a deer that maybe approaches gingerly in the woods, um, or maybe what our approach might be if you see a little, a little puppy that's kind of scared, and, you're, and you're, you get down on, you know, kind of you scrunch down, and you're trying to talk sweet to it and draw it to you so because you, you want to kind of love on it and cuddle it a little bit. Maybe that's, you know, kind of a view of this love that we're looking at here tonight, <coughs> which is very different from the world that we live in. It used to be, and not too long ago, it seemed like, not, not always, not 100% of the time, but it was the male that was the pursuer. It was the male that might have struggled with impure thoughts and all those kind of things, but, but the world we live in today is, is not like that anymore. I mean, it is, it is a, uh, a very vulgar world, a very loud world. It's a very aggressive where, where young women approach young men very aggressively and vice versa. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, check marks. They're trying to, 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 to knock off and things that they say they have accomplished or whatever else. Uh, and that world is changing and their definition of love is changing. Now, God's definition of love does not change. Amen? But, but, th- but the world's definition of love has changed considerably and that's why there's so much confusion. Again, don't have time to go down the road of of the LBGTQ uh, crowd tonight, but they're very, very confused and have a distorted view of what love is, and that is not what God's love is. Christ will never coerce us into a relationship with him. He has revealed his love to us. He used it to beckon us to him. Um, It's up to us to decide whether we're going to receive that or reject that and try and find, you know, that satisfaction, which we never will, somewhere else. So the shepherd speaks to her. (coughs) Her His words are meant to appeal, I believe, to the will, to the mind, and to the heart. Those are the things we're going to look at tonight. 
And if this is what God uses to woo mankind to himself, then there's no doubt these methods will work in our home as well. Now, these aren't the only methods, as I said. This is not a, 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 you know, a tell-all about, about how to raise a family, those kind of things. But there's some methods in here that if we'll use these in our home, I believe they will help us considerably. <coughs> we looked at verse 9. Look at verse 10 now, a call to the will. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The shepherd knows there are a myriad of, of, of forces that are drawing the Shulamite away, beckoning her to other things. There's her own flesh. And with that flesh, no doubt there are, there are physical desires that take place there. There's also doubts and fears and excitements and depressions, all those kind of things. So they have that drawing force. <coughs> then there, there's the, the sensual drawing of Solomon and the, and the appetites of the flesh. And again, I, can, I could go into why I believe that, that the Solomon is really the representation more of the world, and that beckoning uh, uh, goes along with, in, a chap- in, th- in chapter 6, it talks about all of his wives and concubines, and, and he had an appetite that was just more voracious in that area. Anyway, <coughs> so there's that. There's the, the peer pressure of the, the other women in the court there, the intimidation that goes along with that, the pressure of the other women urging her to give in as they have as well. And, and then, and then there's, there's, there's all kinds of pressures that are pulling on her, and the shepherd is trying to woo her away from all the garbage and, and really relate to her will in this area. The, to, to leave the, the negative pool, that really the pool, not P-O-O-L, but P-U-L-L, that draws one away from the sensuality and, the, and really the, the sensual death that the world brings. I think there's two great takeaways that are revealed here in this verse for us to, to look at, to get away from the lust of the flesh and to draw close to the Savior. Those are always good things, amen? Y'all, y'all have to help me out a little bit tonight. Do I need to move around more or talk a little louder? I don't want to woo you to sleep tonight, amen? But, but listen, I, I do believe that these things will help you, all right? All right. All right. So if we look in, let's look here. Uh, where am I? I lost my place there, jumping around. Joshua. We're talking about there's a drawing of the world, there's a drawing of the shepherd, and we need to make a choice. Now, when we're looking at the world, I mean, listen, the world is like a carnival sometimes. I mean, there's just so many things out there that are, that are attracting, and we have to make a decision. Am I going to choose the love of my Savior? Is that going to be what's wooing me and I'm going to give in to that? Or am I going to chase after all the things this world and the flashy lights and all those kind of things? Joshua, we know the verse in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, what does he say? Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that, listen, we need to train and teach the people around us, our wives, our husbands, our children, our grandparents, our, 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 our parents, and, and just say, listen, we, we want to be attracted to the things of God and make those things, I don't think we don't have to make them appealing, they are appealing, but help them to visualize why that is so much better than what the world has to offer. Teach them that, train them that, show them that in your home, because I'm telling you, if you have children, if you have a wife, if you have a husband, you have parents in the home, there are things in this world that is beckoning to them. It is drawing them away. And you think, oh, no, my kid's only seven. He doesn't see that. She doesn't see that. Oh, no, my kid's only a teenager. Oh, no, they have a girlfriend. They have a boyfriend, worse yet. Um, but all those things at college, high school, you know, well, my, my, uh, I got a husband. He's 50-year-old. The flesh doesn't bother him anymore. Really? I mean, okay, well, my husband's 70, and he's not attracted but to women anymore. Really? You know, we're fools if we think those things, and the world is beckoning to them we need to help them see if we are the spiritual one in our home and even if we're learning that how much better the lord is amen in every way <clears throat> the lord gives us a choice every day to choose him and, and and listen if we're being honest we don't always make the right choice we don't always keep him preeminent in our life or, the, or keep him the number one priority as we should in revelation 22 7 the bible says and the spirit and the bride say come and let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. We need to help our loved ones make the choice to choose God. 
and, 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 and be a part of our family. Like I said, there's, there's so many things competing for their time. Work, friends, flesh, house, stress, school. I mean, you name it, health, all kinds of things that are trying to drain our time and our energy. Help them choose God and family. If we're going to do that, listen, it's going to take a proactive approach and not a reactive approach. I've, I say that, I've said that many, many times throughout my ministry. In, in Christianity, we need to be proactive. If you're waiting until your child or your husband or your wife or your grandchildren or your parents have gone astray, you've waited too long. Because then you're in a real battle. I've counseled too many couples, and, I, and, it, and it's heartbreaking when I see the husband or the wife and the switch has already turned. They're, you can tell they're done. They're just there because, you know, maybe to ease their conscience or whatever, but they're done. I mean, you can, and it's just so sad that they've waited this long. And I'm thinking if they only would have come, you know, earlier when this started or, or sought help or sought the Lord, then things might have turned out much differently for you. Help your family learn how to be a good family member. You know, none of us were born to be, no, that's not the way I want to say it. None of us were born knowing how to be a good father or a good mother or even a good child or a good grandparent. You know, we're not born with that knowledge. It, 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 you know, I wasn't born a good husband. As great as a husband as I am, I know, but I wasn't born that way. It took a lot of hard knocks on this head, <laughs> you know, to, to learn how to be a better husband. And I'm still learning. But listen, you need to take the time to train them. Just because you have a child in your home doesn't mean they know how to be a good child. Just because you have a husband doesn't know, doesn't mean that he'll ever know all that you need from a good husband or vice versa, amen? We help them to learn those things Instead of getting aggravated when our expectations are not met and yelling and slamming doors and all those kind of things, we help them to learn that, that process along the way. You know, when you were first dating, you wooed your spouse to yourself. As I, a lot of hands went up here earlier, you know. And, and you can probably think back at some of the things that you, that you used to do. You know, when your child was first born, think about how often you spent time with that child. How often you took care of them and taught them and trained them and hugged on them and kissed on them and loved on them and all those kind of things. Can I just help you out? Parents, no matter how much your kids say ick, they still love it. Smother them, slobber all over them, grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads. Don't stop. Doesn't matter if they're 18, 20, 30, 50, whatever. You have a kid that's, you have a grandchild that's 80, then you're doing really well. But <laughs> definitely kiss on them some more. We used to woo them early in the relationships, but somewhere along the way, the wooing from us stopped. We think, oh, well, I'm married now, or oh, they're, they're a teenager now, or oh, they don't need that anymore, or they don't care about grandma and grandpa anymore, or whatever else. Yes, they do. You may have stopped wooing them, but the world has not. The world is constantly wooing them. Satan has not stopped, and he will not stop until he's taken out of this world. And he's doing everything in his power. He's using everything that he's got at, 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 at his fingertips, if you will, to woo your husband, to woo your wife, to woo your child away from you, away from God, away from church, uh, uh, away from anything that's holy or good. I mean, think about how, 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 how I don't want to say that word, how tricky, <laughs> maybe I can say that word, Satan is. Turn, turn if you will, hold your place there in Song of Solomon. Look over in Genesis chapter 3. I know that, that we know the story here in church tonight. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> the Bible says, now the what? Maybe not everyone's there. We'll try it again. Give you a few seconds. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent. Okay, and, and who is that? Satan, amen. Heath called me the other day. We were taking the girls to the airport. He said, Dad, there's a great big uh, um, rattlesnake out by the woods. Can I kill it? Kim at first was like, no, because she's worried about the shock. And I was like, yes. I don't want to bite someone. And, um, and we went out there after I got home. I was very proud of him. He, he took a 20-gauge shotgun, and there was pieces of that snake everywhere. 
And that's what they should look like in the woods. Amen? Pieces, not a full snake. But anyway. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. He is so crafty. Think about this. He drew the very first people in the world away from their personal creator. I mean, that's, that's what he did. A God that spoke personally to them. And think about this. Satan did that some 10,000 years ago. If you believe it's 10 million years, you're probably in the wrong church. But anyway, some 10,000 years ago, without fornication, didn't need that. Without money, he didn't, he didn't need that. Things that are drawing people away today. Without fame, without pornography, without drugs, without alcohol, without uh, showing forth some great power, all those kind of promises. He did it with a tree with some fruit on it and a promise to know good and evil. And that's it. That's all he used and drew the very first people away from that intimate relationship with God. Now, if he did that with people that were perfect and had never sinned, been born without sin, or created without sin, maybe we should say it that way, had been created without sin, what do you think he's going to do to your family if he gets a hold of them? It's very real. Here's what's cool, though. God has given you all that you need through him and through his word to keep your family close. I mean, think about this. I mean, your spouse chose you, amen? I don't think, well, I could be wrong. No one in here was forced into the relationship with their wife or husband with a shotgun, right? No one had that. Don't raise your hand if you were, but no one. They, they chose you. They love you. God has put that inside of a, uh, uh, of a woman and a husband. When a child is born, they love that child. It's a, it's a natural thing, and that child grows up loving mommy and daddy. It's amazing to me, and, s- and it's heartbreaking as well, when you see the case of children that are abused that still just love mommy and daddy with all their heart. And that's just, that's a, now that, that might change later on as they get a little older, but it's something they're born innate inside of them. Listen, don't take that for granted, and don't let it slip away. We must woo our family, keep them close. Don't stop doing that because, again, the world is pulling. The first call to her will was to be united with him, to be with him. Listen, do we call our family to unite? Do we even try and, and, and sit down and have dinner together, have meetings together, have talks together? Listen, can I tell you this? Your, 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 your child doesn't need a text message. Your child needs face-to-face time. They, they need to have time with mommy and daddy if they're both in the home. If, if not, then whoever's there, they need to have time with mommy or time with daddy or time with grandparents or whoever else it is, and, and, and maybe even with your parents as well. They need that personal face-to-face. That's what God created us, to be a part of, 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 of what's going on, to, make, to be part of the decision-making, to be part of, of the laughter, to be part of, of the work in the home, all of those things. Too often, I think, especially in the case, maybe I was going to say especially for mothers, but it might be fathers as well, you know, we don't allow our kid to interact with us when we're trying to fix something or clean something because our thought is, I can just do it easier myself. You know, I, I can do it in half the time. I don't worry, have to worry about them spilling the sugar as we're making something. I don't worry, have to worry about them, you know, gouging the cars or trying to fix it or whatever else. And we're missing tremendous opportunities when we don't teach them to, 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 be, to unite in the family in whatever it is that we're doing, connecting on a personal level. So we had a call to the will. Then if you read in verse, go back to Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 2 again, we see a call to the mind. In verse 11 he says, For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green, green figs, and the vines with the tender grape Give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The life that the shepherd calls her to is so much better than a life that she can imagine on her own. It's a life that is able to let go of the failures of the past. Look in verse 11. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. Be careful, wives, husbands, parents, 
children when we keep bringing up the hurt of the past. You'd be wise to forgive them and let it go. I'm not saying that you say it's okay. You don't say, hey, it's okay, Johnny, that you stole that money from mommy or whatever else. That's, that's, not, no, that's not what I'm saying. But you do say, I'm forgiving you and I'm not going to bring it up again. You know, and then you don't. You don't bring those things up and you, you praise them when they do right, those kind of things. But listen, it, it, we, we, when we beat them down, we're pushing them away. To love is to let go. That's what God did for you and I, amen? If that's what he did for you and I, it's what we can do with our family. The past is the past. If it's carried into the future, it's because you carried it there. And it does not need to be there. Let it go. When God saved us, he eradicated all the sins of the past. Amen? Just like they never existed. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. He didn't sweep it under the rug. He didn't put it on a shelf. No doubt we have memories of those things, but he doesn't bring it up and beat us up with it. The stain and the guilt have been removed. Now listen, everyone in a home makes mistakes, amen? Their mistake might have been something they've done. Your mistake is continuing to bring it up. But everyone is making mistakes. And, and certainly there are mistakes, some of them that are bigger than others, right? And those, those things happen. Those things, are, that's true. But the shepherd here set an example. He says, the cold and the bitterness of the past are gone. And he says, now we're going to move into the springtime, and we're going to stay there. If some folks could just let go of the past, quit holding on to it, quit using it to fight your battles, quit looking through the lens of it to judge your child, to judge your spouse, to judge your parents. Let go of those things. Quit looking through those lenses and look into the new growth of springtime, uh, the, the, the pleasantness of it. And then, and then listen, then families can move on and start a new growth to begin and relationships start to, to, to be healed and even blossom from that. And listen, it's not easy. He talks about the winter. I've lived, I mean, Alabama gets cold. I think he's in the 20s, right? I mean, I don't know if it's gotten much colder than 20. It gets cold here. I've lived in places like North Dakota where it's minus 80 with a wind chill and, and Alaska where everything's frozen and uh, uh, in Pennsylvania it gets pretty cold there and in Michigan, off the, the, the winds of the Great Lakes. Once you start shivering and you're out in the cold, it's very, very hard to warm up again. But can I tell you, once that cold creeps into your family, it's very, very hard to get past that. It's not easy. But listen, by God's grace, you can do that. Wrap some break blankets around each other, get a fire going, amen, and get rid of that. Turn some lights on, get springtime back in that house again. It's a life that looks for new opportunities. He says there in verse 12 again, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Now, a couple of those I understand. I don't understand the voice of the turtle. I'll just be honest with you. I don't really hear turtles making a lot of noise, but it sounds kind of cool. Reminds me of a Disney cartoon or something with turtles are singing in the background. But anyway, design your home to be one that can clearly see and understand the blessings of God on your home in your home, in your life. Make those things the focal point, the focus of your family. Make God the focus. Yes, remind them. Purposely remind them. Hey, listen, look how good God's been to us. It's okay to bring those up, parents. I mean, I'm not talking about beating them over the head with this stuff, but say, do you see how good God is? I mean, right now, none of us are sick. Isn't that a blessing from God? Hey, do you guys know that we got food on the table tonight? Do you know that all over the world people don't have that? What a blessing of God that we have that tonight. We don't deserve it, but God's graciously given it. There's a, there's, a, there's a hole, there's a hole. There's a roof over our head with no holes in it, amen? Or maybe there's only one hole in the roof, whatever, but amen, praise the Lord. I mean, those, there are some blessings out there, you know? I mean, remind them of those things. Remind each other of those things. It's so easy. It's so easy to look at the negative. Anyone can do that. I mean, to see, oh, what, this house is so small, and it's so cluttered, and this is going on, my health, and my bunions on my feet hurt, and, and I, you know, I got a headache today, and, you know, the neighbor's dog was barking last night, uh, you know. And those are all real troubles. Don't get me wrong. They're bothersome. But there's so many more blessings that God has given us. Remind one another. Don't focus on the negative. Focus on the things of God. Compassion understanding, companionship, assistance, 
fun, amen? Those kind of things. Encourage new growth and steps of faith. As a family unit, woo your family into new adventures for the Lord. Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to get your family excited. Hey, you know, it might be, uh, you know a small place to start off? Hey, let's read through the family, the, the, the Bible this, this year as a family. Let's memorize a chapter of the, of the Bible or something. Those aren't, those aren't big. You don't have to take a mission trip to Timbuktu to do those kind of things. Amen? Everyone has a Bible in their home. Or maybe you take on a project at church as a family or a project in your community or whatever else. Or start going soul winning together. It's exciting as we've had more families come out soul winning. That just blesses my soul. Amen? That's awesome to me. If you can make it, again, I'm not trying to beat you up if you're not here. I know not everyone can make it on a Saturday, but, but you might can go out with your family on a Tuesday night or a, or, a, or a Saturday night or some other time. Do Find something like that to do with your family. We have a call to the will of the Shulamite. We have a call to the mind of the Shulamite, God beckoning to our mind and our will. Then we have a call to the heart or to the emotions. Look in verse 14. O oh my dove that are in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. The hiding places of the clefts of the rock, of the cliff, if you will. He wanted what was being held back in the hiding places of her heart. You know, sometimes your spouse just wants to know you better. Maybe you have that spouse that always says, hey, what you thinking? Hey, what's your thoughts on this? Or what, the, you know, and don't get frustrated with that. What that means is you need to open up more to them. Let them have more of you. And, and listen, that is what God wants from us, amen? He, just, he wants our whole heart. He wants all of our love. He wants all of our strength. He wants all of our power, all of our mind. He wants all of those things. There's nothing wrong, listen, it's, it's nothing wrong. It's, it's, it's completely right to give that to him, Amen? But we also need to give that to our spouse. We need to give that to our children. We need to give that to our parents. Can I help you out just one more thing here? Teenagers there, mostly back there on the back row. You're kind of young, but not, you know. Jacob, the rest of you. The world says at a certain age, I don't know what that age is, maybe it's 12, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 18, you know, that you're supposed to become independent now, is that true? You need to learn how to stand on your own. You need to learn how to work. You need to learn how to think. You need to make choices that are right that's biblically. Amen? But along with that, they make it like you need to turn your back on your parents. You know, they're old. They're fuddy-duddies. It's, me, it's my time out there to grab a hold of all the things this world has to offer. Nothing wrong with having an adventure in your life as long as it's, as it's godly adventure. The wrong part is when you turn your back on your family. That's never biblical. You know, by the way, you know, the Bible talks about when we get married, we cleave to our spouses. That doesn't mean we slam the door in the face of our parents. Amen? Never says that. Never, never, never says there's a time when we should stop honoring our parents. That, that should never happen. Always stay close to your family. I've lost my place. Don't hold back from your wife, your husband, your children, your parents. Let them have all of you. Too often when families drift apart, we think this, I wish they would love me like they used to. You know, part of the problem is we don't show them that same love that we used to show them as well. If, you're, if your thoughts are, they don't show me the love that they used to show me, listen, try pouring out the love on them. Not in a way that you drown them, <laughs> but just be gracious and kind and loving in your language and your attitude towards them and the, the, the things that you do. He talks about the countenance. Let me see thy countenance. What does your face show? You know, sometimes we ask someone, in our, maybe it's the husband, maybe it's the wife, maybe it's the child, maybe it's the parent, and we say, hey, what's wrong? Nothing. Now, that's believable, right? <laughs> I mean, the face is showing what's in the heart. It's the countenance. It's from what's inside. Light your face up, amen? Sometimes it looks like it ought to be lit on fire, but I'm talking about light it up from inside with the things of God. And let that come out from inside of you. If you're not spending time in the word of God, doing your devotions, your prayer time, those kind of things, that's not going to happen. Or if it does, it's going to be fake. It's going to be that strained smile. You know, how are you doing today? 
Good. You know, like when you're at work or whatever else and you don't want to be there that day. Hey, how's it going? Good. You know, that's not believable. And can I tell you, your, your family knows that. Your husband knows that. Your wife knows that. Your children know that. Your parents know that. Countenance is something that comes from the inside. A countenance ought to be inviting because that's what the Lord is doing. He's got a beautiful countenance. His countenance is like, come, all who will come, come unto me. Uh, uh, come unto me, I'll, 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 I'll relieve your burden, I'll relieve your stress, I'll be, I'll be a, a comfort to you, I'll listen to you. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. What's going on on the inside? I'm not talking about because you sit around and listen to, to jokes all day on the radio. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a cheerfulness that comes from inside from your walk with the Lord. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. There's families that are broken, that are falling apart because mommy or daddy or children are just, they got that look on their face. Everything, like, eh. hey, Junior, how's it going? Eh, eh. How's school today? Eh, you know. How's work today, mommy? Eh. Hey, daddy, what are you working on? Eh, you know. There ought to be no place for eh in the family. Just get rid of it. I mean, just, and, and if you're that way, be honest with it. Hey, mommy's having a long day. Hey, daddy's having a long day. Hey, hey Junior's having a long day or whatever else. I love you very much, but I need to go and, and spend some time with the Lord so I can take care of this. Or how about this? You know, you come home, you had a long day. You're the husband walking through the door, you know. The wife says, how's your day today? You know what? It's not been very good. Will you come and pray with me about that? What a great way to handle that situation. Junior comes home from school. Hey, how was, how was your day today? Mom was horrible. You know, this happened at school. Some friends did this or did that or whatever else. Hey, will you pray with me? Hey, just pray with me for a few minutes. Maybe I can tell you about it afterwards. Isn't that so much better than the way we usually, eh, you know? Just, it takes five minutes. It can change your life. It'll change your relationship. I'm telling you, Satan is using everything in his power to distance mommies and daddies, to distance children from parents, to distance parents from children and grandparents and all those kind of things. He's given us some tremendous tools that will fix those things. It'll, it'll help us. And, it, and it, it is not taken, it's not like you've got to go and take a, a, a course in theology to spend three minutes in prayer with your child or three minutes in prayer with your husband or your wife or whatever else. And that cheerful confidence that comes out will produce cheerful countenance in others as well. And it's amazing, you know, when, 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 when in our home, if Kim is in a great cheerful mood, I'm in a great, it just seems to permeate throughout the whole house and, and, and vice versa, you know. When one of us, is in a bad mood. No, I'm just <laughs> that also permeates throughout the house. You know that? <laughs> Everyone can feel that. But if you just confess it and say, hey, listen, I'm in a crabby mood today. Will you pray for me? Or can we spend a few time? Or I'm going to go take a nap or whatever else. But I, but I, I don't want to act this way around you because I love you too much. You know, say some things like that. He talks about there, and, and just one more thing, and I'll be done here. Let me see that countenance. Let me hear thy voice. What does your voice say? Is it words of condemnation or is it words of commendation? Because there's a very big difference, amen? Is your words always cutting and putting down or are they edifying and lifted up? God edify. Now listen, there's a time to correct, amen? There's a time you might tell your husband or your wife, hey, listen, probably shouldn't have done it that way, you know? I mean, not saying it just like that, but you know what I mean? There's a time to sometimes have those conversations there's a time definitely to tell our children, hey, listen, you know, Johnny, you messed up there. And there's some consequence for these actions, whatever else it is. I mean, we still love you, but whatever. But besides the, the correction and, and, and the learning, those kind of things, our words should be edifying. The Bible tells us, and I'll be done, Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. That's pretty. Amen? Have you just imagine that? That's what our words ought to do. Our words ought to invite and woo and edify and lift up. That's going to change countenances in our home. That's going to that's gonna change our, 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 our the application of what we're doing from instead of pushing them away, now we're drawing them back. We're calling out to their heart and we're calling out to their mind, and we're calling out to their will. And listen, do that before it's too late. Amen?
your kids are not too young to start this process. Your marriage is not too old to start this process. You know, make your husband come home and say, or your wife come home and say, or your children come home and say, man, what happened to you? And just say, the Lord, the Lord happened to me. I'm letting him do some things in my heart and my life, so pray for me. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word. Lord, what a beautiful picture as we see the shepherd wooing the Shulamite. Father, all the pressures that are going on in life. Father, but I believe your voice is just so much more beautiful and calming and wooing than anything else around her. I pray, Father, as husbands, Lord, as wives tonight, as children tonight, as parents tonight, Father, grandparents or loved ones or even friends, help us to have that wooing effect. Where we draw people, Lord, together, or most importantly to you, but also as a family. Father, you know the, the battle that is waging in this world, and Satan is winning over and over and over again. I pray, Father, that God's Way Baptist Church has families that are strengthened, Lord, that are encouraging and being ready because of that, Lord, for the battles that they will face, no doubt, Lord. We have strong families, Father, that glorify who you are and what you've done with our families. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I don't